that's me. Uh, welcome all of you. I mean, it's, uh, I see that there are several participants, almost 62 now, it keeps on fluctuating, but I think we are sticking around 60 to 70. So welcome all of you. And uh, we are going to listen to a group of experts and we're going to go almost all over the world. We're going to go to China. We're going to start with Spain, go to China, and then stay in China for a little bit. And then the delegates are from India and from Ukraine. So we're covering most of the globe. And I'm sure you'll hear some good things from uh, people who've been doing some very good research in uh, livelihoods and mountainous livelihoods. And uh, this se se session focuses on, uh, on, on livestock. So I'm sure you'll learn uh, uh, many interesting things. So without uh, spending more time, I'd like to invite Dr. Sergio to come on and let us know what excellent work he's done in Spain. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm going to share my screen so you can see the presentation. All right. Okay, the title of my lecture is Grassland Livestock Interface, which is quite a broad topic, as you, as you can guess. So I'm going to focus on a basic question, uh, my presentation, which is, is grazing by livestock good or bad for grassland? Of course, this is a too vague and broad question, but I think it's going to be useful for, for uh, exploring the context. So I'm going to focus on a specific study case. Uh, we are going to summarize the findings of the report Extensive Grazing and Habitat Conservation, Analysis of the Effect of Extensive Grazing on the Conservation of Habitats of Community Interest in Spain. You have here the link to the full report in case you, you need, uh, you're interested in having more information. So what we have done, uh, we have uh, studied, explored the impact of extensive livestock grazing in the conservation status of natural and semi-natural habitats in the European Union. Okay, we have uh, based this study on official European Union data. So we didn't went to the field or didn't uh, uh, try ourselves. This is the official European Union data, so it's, it's uh, really reliable. We take the case of Spain because Spain is one of the European Union countries where pastoral activity is more important. And also because more than half of all the types of uh, habitats of the European Union are present in, in Spain. So Spain is really representative of the biodiversity, represent very well the biodiversity of the European Union. Of the European Union. So a little bit, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, about the source of the data. This is important to understand the, the rest of the, the, the outcome of the study and the results. So uh, we have in the European Union a piece of law, which is called the Habitats Directive that protects not only habitat, but also all the rest of the animal species and plants. Apart from birds, birds have their own habitat, uh, sorry, their own directive. So the, the Habitat Directive describes what they call habitats of community interest. This type of habitats are uh, in Annex 1 with a higher, a really high degree of, of conservation status because one, because they are endangered or because they have a better restrict area or because they are outstanding examples uh, from the ecological point of view. So these are the most important habitats we have in all the European Union, okay? And they are characterized in different types like forest, grassland and subtypes and so on up to, to being able up to describe them very specifically each of the habitats. We are going to see some examples later. So the Habitat Directive lists today 233 European types of habitats that uh, are habitats of community interest, where I'm going, I'm going to refer further on to them as HCI. And as I said, a little bit more than half are present in Spain. So according to one of the articles of this Habitat Directive, the European Union members, Spain and all the rest of the countries have to report every six years, I think, 
uh, on the conservation status and the trend of this habitat. So we know how, how well are doing these habitats and what is the trend. If they are uh, being, uh, this conservation status is improving or is getting worse and so on. So this is very interesting. Uh, the conservation status assessment is made by national teams of experts that mostly are the, the, those uh, researchers that are publishing and really know very well each of the habitat, mostly are botanists and ecologists. You have here the link to see all the, the database, which is a huge database, as you can see, as you can guess, because it goes all through the 27 or something uh, countries of the European Union, also through all the habitats, there are 233, and also through all the biodiverse, bio, geographical region, which is Atlantic, Mediterranean, and so on. So it's a huge database. So we have been done to make it easier. This is an example of the kind of types of habitat that are described in the, in the, in the Habitat Directive. This is a, one kind of very valuable uh, upland grasslands, which are very valuable for, for, uh, for racing and is also endangered. Or this is another one. They go with four numbers, like six, six, two, two, zero. This is one, this is another one, and so on. So what we have done is to check all this uh, habitat for Spain, and we have checking the description of the threats and pressures on this habitat. And we make made a big uh, database where, where we filter all the threats related to grassley, to grazing, <coughs> to grazing, sorry. So we can know uh, which habitats grazing is good or bad and at which extent, okay? So filtering all this, by the way, we did, we started analyzing only grasslands, but then we, uh, we noticed that grazing activity is very important in many other habitats, like forests, wetland, scrubs. So we are using all habitats, all habitats for this study, all Spanish habitats for this study. So the first things that this that this uh, database uh, show up, which is which is interesting already, is the big differentiation they made between intensive grazing and extensive grazing. So for those who you among you that are not so familiar with these two kind of um, of systems, this uh, farming system, intensive grazing, they are grasslands that are not allowed the time needed to recover from grazing naturally. So you need to put chemical pesticides and fertilizer, artificial fertilizer, to make possible the plants to grow again. This uh, is a picture of what could be an intensive grazing system. And conversely, there are other, there are extensive grazing systems, which is this one, uh, for example, which is in southern Spain. Extensive grazing systems feed livestock, making use of the natural resources of the territory with a low use of external inputs. External inputs, you know, is uh, fuel, uh, artificial food, uh, many other things. So the animals normally get it from the, from the environment. So this is the first difference that the experts made when they analyze racing, the impact of racing on the natural, on this uh, protected habitat. Another big difference they made is uh, related to threats and pressure is over grazing and lack of grazing. So overgrazing occurs when grasslands are grazed in such a way, well, not only grasslands, but any, any habitat, in fact, that are grazing in such a way that plant community cannot recover from grazing. This causes erosion, soil loss, and impoverishment of the plant community. Both as a grassland, you lose also the pastures, but also as an ecosystem, and as, from the biodiversity point of view. But there is the opposite problem also that has been identified in many of these of, this, uh, uh, of the European Union habitats, which is the lack of grazing. When lack of grazing uh, happens, there is new, uh, more, uh, let's say, aggressive or dominant species that take over all the ecosystem and can make disappear this habitat. And by, uh, by plant, by botanical uh, succession. So in this picture, you see how some, some uh, brush, some, um, yeah, bushes are uh, growing over a, a grassland because of the last lack of use. This 
normally is caused caused uh, by diversity loss and so many of our habitats, the habitats that we have in the European Union, which very uh, high important from the point of view of uh, biodiversity, are semi-natural habitats. This means that these habitats only exist because there is traditional activities that are related to the survival of this habitat. So these habitats that we are studying include natural habitats and semi-natural habitats, habitats that are dependent from traditional activities, which are many of the grasslands. So what are the main conclusions uh, of our report? The first thing, which is quite obvious for those of you that uh, work on the topic, is that extensive livestock grazing and intensive livestock grazing have a very different impact, often opposite, on the conservation status of habitat. So it is urgent to clearly characterize and differentiate extensive and intensive livestock grazing features in order to recognize and better understand the different impact on habitat conservation. So it doesn't make much sense, coming back to the first question I made, doesn't make uh, much sense just to talk about uh, if grazing is positive or negative if we don't separate clearly before these two kind of uh, farming systems or grazing systems. And this is very important when we uh, talk about uh, subsidies and incentives that are very important, for example, in Europe. So before uh, we decide to, to support or to uh, limit any grazing activity, we need to separate these two things. And this is very difficult, with well, not so, so difficult, but this has not been done in most of the administration and most of the government. They understand and talk about all these two very different opposite systems as the same thing. So this is one of the things of the problem that we have to fix. The second uh, main uh, conclusion is that 80% of Spanish terrestrial habitats of community interest, well, I didn't say it before, but we only analyze it for obvious reasons, the terrestrial habitats, there are also marine habitats. So, um, but we have taken all the terrestrial habitats. So 80% are in an unfavorable state. So they are in bad shape from the conservation point of view. So we have a very big problem, not only in Spain, this is the same situation in, in uh, at the European, and, uh, European Union level. Extension life to grazing is a major biodiversity conservation tool. So it's very much related with the shape, good shape or bad shape of many of these habits. For example, measures proposed by the European Union for preserving one third of all the Spanish uh, habitats, terrestrial habitats, includes to adapt or reinstate mowing, grazing, and other equivalent agricultural activities. So they are linked together. The, 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 the survival of our habitats, or one third of our habitats, are related very closely with traditional activities, mostly with grazing. So the design of local grazing management plans is needed to adapt the management of extensive livestock grazing at local level. We are maintain both a good conservation status of grazing habitats, as well as the sustainability of the grazing activity and the communities they live from. The third main uh, conclusion of the, of the study is that under grazing by livestock or abandonment of pastoral activity is a major threat for the conservation of many types of many types of Spanish habitats. 60% of all terrestrial habitats are endangered by the lack of grazing activity. Okay, so this includes all habitats, all terrestrial habitats. So if we take, for example, only the grasslands, this percentage is going to be much bigger. So the conclusion is that grazing is needed for conservation of Spanish habitats for well, at least one third. Of course, some, uh, some uh, terrestrial habitats are so um, fragile that doesn't allow grazing, but one third of them, one third, sorry, 60% of them need grazing for survival, for improving their conservation status. Okay, so what does this mean? Uh, if we need now to take a bigger picture to understand why is the case that uh, grazing is so important for European Union habitat. This will be the same, I guess, in every corner of the, of the globe, but uh, we have uh, 
we have the data just just for the European Union. So it is clear that all habitats have co evolved along uh, along the many times with extensive grazing from wild herbivores. This is a recreation of the uh, of Granada, of the city I'm living now in southern Spain. This is the recreation of the of the landscape and the communities, the the, the um, herbivorous communities that uh, were living here not so long, long time ago, from the ecological point of view, of course. So this was the this was the context uh, among many of the plants, many uh, uh, many animals, and by and clearly um, habitats has evolved. So they need and they are adapted to grazing. And, and movement, big movements of uh, herbivores. Then, uh, as you know, uh, humans has followed herbivores in their seasonal migrations to hunt them. Before, when we were hunter gatherers, we just went up and down to the mountains in summer, to the high altitudes in summer, looking as uh, as the, as um, herbivores were looking for for the green grass, for the best pastures. Uh, we went with them looking for for uh, hunting them and the same way back in winter to the lowlands so we have been moving up and down in the same uh, in the same way uh, following the the, the, the um, these grazers these wild grazers in the same way that we are moving up and down with transhumans and with um, the movements of the cattle in summer and so on probably you are in your country familiar with with this, with this. So we knew all these, all these roads, so to say, the drop roads and all these uh, systems. And once we started uh, to um, to breed uh, domestic uh, herbivores ourselves, we were just doing the same. We were just do, following the same, the same path and the same roads up and down. So pastoralists have recreated through extensive grazing and transhumans. The roots and seasonal migrations and the ecological processes that wild ungulates today cannot sufficiently perform in most of the habitats because of habitat fragmentation, you know, fences, roads, everything can, can you imagine? Uh, that wild ungulates today, um, sorry, the habitat fragmentation, the impoverishment, impoverishment of the grazing species diversity, there are much less quantities of, uh, of herbivores now. of um, uh, the richness and the diversity of the species now than before. And in some areas, there is a low uh, density of wild herbivores too. So as for, uh, to provide you an example of this, a clear example of this, I have been researching on, on, on vultures in Spain, you know, these raptors that uh, feed on dead animals. And uh, uh, it's very weird that, uh, so, uh, for example, the colonies from the Pyrenees fly more than 1,000 kilometers to feed on southern Spain and southwest uh, Spain. Even if they have a lot of feed of food uh, in the same territory. So we don't know why, even when they have the chicks, the babies, which is they really need to get back to the nest every almost every day, they, fl they fly uh, more than 1,000 kilometers. And the interesting thing is they are following exactly the um, mostly the same drove road that the transhuman is performed nowadays. So it's not that they need that food, but it's that they are adapted and they have some probably we don't know why, but some kind of culture of going along with the, with the, with the livestock up and down to the mountains through huge distances. In the same way that uh, wild herbivores does in the in the past, they were there also. They were doing the same. So they they are some for some reason keeping doing the same. So this is how um, our habitats were shaped, and this is why this is still very important uh, uh, extensive uh, grazing for uh, for plant communities. So for giving you an example, a more concrete example of, uh, uh, I'm trying to get rid of the top, uh, well, doesn't matter. Um, the, um, the, uh, for giving you some, some studies that are now analyzing this impact, this more concrete impact of uh, extensive grazing in, in habitats, 
uh, sheep, for example, uh, 1,000 sheep, which is the average uh, size of a flock here in Spain, or 100 transhuman cows disperse more than 150 million seeds and about 100 tons of manure over more than 500 kilometers of valleys, rivers, lobes, mountains, plateaus, and so on during the journeys of approximately one month, walking along the drop road that cross all Spain, for example. So this means that they are having a huge uh, ecological road in plant community. I'm just talking about dispersing seeds now, but we can talk also about fertilizing. We can talk also about uh, preventing fires and so on. So when we talk about extensive grazing, we should uh, think also about, and we should link this activity to adaptation to climate change, because many of these plant communities are now are in a very strong need of moving up and down uh, on the on the mountains, as you know because they, they're probably their altitudes they have been uh, evolving are not suitable anymore for them, for these plant communities to survive. So they will probably go, need to go up if the temperatures are increasing, for example. So the role of, of um, extensive grazing can be very important on that. Also, we can talk about soil, uh, soil protection. Uh, it's very clear. The, the, the difference between intensive and extensive grazing in relation to soil protection. Uh, the, the, the pastures that are in a well, that are uh, grazed in a suitable manner with a, with a capacity that allows the, the regeneration of plants are much more able to, to store carbon and to store the, the, the soil. We also can talk about animal welfare, for example, comparing the industrial uh, the industrial um, uh, business of uh, meat production with with uh, extensive grazing. We can talk about preserved biodiversity. Many many species depend on the on the semi natural steps like uh, the great uh, bastard and also the um, uh, many many uh, steppic uh, species are depending on the pastoral activity to maintain this habitat. Also, we can talk about pollution, uh, about how uh, in, if you make uh, an uh, intensive farming, all the manure of the animals is just con contaminating the ground. And conversely, in the extensive uh, grazing, the manure is just fertilizing uh, the natural habitat. We can talk about circular economy. We can talk about uh, a CO2 footprint, which is very different when you are doing uh, extensive grazing because there are very little income of um, of, um, for, of uh, sorry um, fossil fuels, which is very different from intensive intensive um, uh, grazing where you need a lot of uh, yeah electricity. Uh, food, light, heat, whatever, or ventilation and so on. We can talk also about forest fires. In Spain, there are so much, so many uh, initiatives that are using uh, extensive lights to, for preventing forest fires that you know is a huge problem in Mediterranean Europe. Very successful programs, but of course, it's always bigger business to, to, um, to buy uh, planes and huge machinery is a huge, there's a huge industry interest there, much more than promoting extensive grazing. So the, the pressure on the governments, as you can imagine, is much, much more from, from the grazing sector. We can talk about sustainability, we can talk about food sovereignty, about the quality of the food and the health, how healthy the food is, the food that we are talking, hormones and so on. The, the, um, um, Antibiotics and things. There is, there is a lot of uh, of uh, collateral interesting topics related with the grazing and, and uh, extensive grazing. So, just for finishing, uh, the overall conclusion from our report, uh, as we understand it, is that the survival of many, many of our most valuable habitats and species is directly linked to the survival of well managed extensive grazing. And the survival of those communities and governance institutions that make them possible. What this means is that uh, extensive grazing doesn't happen just in a vacuum uh, 
cannot be solved by by just technical technical um, support. You need communities with uh, with a culture and the knowledge local and local and traditional knowledge to uh, to perform that that activity. And also, you need not only the community, but the governance institutions that are ruling these communities. And there is a big problem. We don't have much time to talk about it, but it's a huge problem on the class between uh, the, uh, this uh, capitalist uh, economic system uh, when they met the governance institution of extensive racing that more are mostly are common common systems, common collective uh, governance systems, which as you can guess, doesn't fit so well in the, uh, in the capitalist uh, view of the world. So this is the fight uh, of our time. And this is how we uh, expect to be contributing a little bit with this, with this study. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks very much, Sergio, for a lovely talk. Uh, and uh, sort of for uh, illustrating all these important aspects of what extensive grazing does, I was quite taken by the fact that agricultural landscapes need grazing to survive. You know, that was a very interesting thing. And I'm sure you've, uh, you've done a lot of work to support that, which is, which is excellent. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And in case, because we are still uh, within the time, in case there are people who need to ask any questions, but any doubts, perhaps you could uh, chat with Sergio in, in the chat box, perhaps. Thank you very much. Thank you.